blissful music with every note you raise my heart is filled with rapture my soul is lost in praise have a seat welcome to the beltline church of christ thankful that you are here today we are surrounded by so many wonderful people and so many great guests that have come to join us today and I just want to welcome you and thank you that you are here today. It is a pleasure and a privilege to get to stand before you. I am so excited about today. I love Resurrection Sunday. I love uh, that every Sunday we get to celebrate the death, burial, and resurrection of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. But today we get to join with so many in the world who are doing exactly the same thing. And what a, what a reason to rejoice, to sing on, as we just said, that is, uh, to just praise our God for what he's done and what he's accomplished for us. If you have your Bibles, go with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. I want to start reading with verse 13, and we're going to read a little bit of a lengthy section of Scripture, but it's going to kind of establish where we're going to go today. And I hope that you are rejoicing in your own hearts uh, about what God has done and is continuing to do for us. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, take a look at verse 13. Here's what the Apostle Paul says, carrying on what we just had read for us a second ago. He says, but if there is no resurrection of the dead then not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, then our preaching is in vain, and your faith is in vain, and we are found to be misrepresenting God because we testified about God that he raised Christ, whom he did not raise, if it is true that the dead are not raised. For if the dead are not raised, not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile, and you are still in your sins. And then those also who have fallen asleep or died in Christ have perished. If in Christ we have hope in this life only, we are of all people the most to be pitied. And then Paul says three words that I love. If you have a a pen and you underline in your Bible, here's the three to underline. But in fact... You see, Paul says this is, not a, this is not an educated guess. This isn't wishful thinking. This isn't pie in the sky, uh, sweet by and by thinking. No, he says this is fact. It is absolutely true. It is founded on solid evidence. He says, but in fact, Christ has been raised from the dead. The first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. For as by man came death, by man has also come the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, so also in Christ shall all be made alive, but each in his own order. Christ, the firstfruits, then it is coming those who belong to Christ. And then comes the end when he delivers the kingdom to God, the Father, after destroying every rule and every authority and every power. For he must reign until he has put all enemies under his feet. The last enemy to be destroyed is death. Today we celebrate the day death died. And that is what happened when Jesus Christ rose from the dead. But without that resurrection, everything that you and I do, without the resurrection, everything we do in the name of the Lord is all for nothing. Without the resurrection, there is no hope, there is no future, there is nothing. But like Paul, I want to declare to you today, but in fact... Jesus Christ is raised from the dead. He is alive. The tomb continues to be empty. You remember John chapter 1, verse 14, where John says uh, in chapter 1, verse 1, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God. We know that, but I love verse 14. Verse 14 says, The Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we have seen His glory. The glory is of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. What is he saying to us in John chapter 1? What what is he trying to get across to us? And what he's trying to get across is what I have on the board for you. That our God is eternal. And I want you to think with me for a minute through this idea that God is eternal. Because this is something that is very difficult for you and me to get our minds around. We are fleshly. We are not eternal. He is. What that means is God is not bound by time the way that you and I are. But when the Word became flesh, when Jesus took on flesh, all of that changed. Think with me for a minute. He who time had never touched became wrapped up in it for us. In Jerusalem, when he was 12 years old, he heard his mom and his daddy say, Time's up, got to go home. 
when he was about to start his ministry, he had to leave Nazareth because his time had come. He went to the cross and died because his time was up. His time had come. The man who was never bound by time for all eternity lived in it for over 30 years. The boundless became bound. The Word became flesh. For more than three decades, His once limitless reach was limited to the stretch of a human arm. His speed checked to the pace of human feet. Here's my question. Did Jesus ever consider transporting Himself to the next city? (laughs) I wonder sometimes. Surely he had the ability to do that. I know driving that long trip, I'm like, man, I wish we could, wish we could just be there. Just, just show up. I wonder if, if Jesus ever had those thoughts. When, when it was cold and nasty and miserable and the rain chilled him, was he ever tempted to say, I think I'm ready for some sunshine? And, and the sun came out and, and, and shone. I, I don't know. I don't know if he ever had those thoughts or not, but I do know that he never acted upon those thoughts. I know that he would not use his supernatural powers for his own personal comfort. And I know that because I see that throughout Scripture, but I also see that's what Satan tempts him to do in Matthew 4, isn't it? Come on, Jesus, just make these stones become bread. Just go ahead and use your gifts, use your power to to make yourself a little more comfortable while you walk this earth. And Jesus says, ah, get behind me. You don't understand that I don't live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. But you need to know that with one word, he could have done all of that. With one word, Jesus could have transformed the hard earth, which he often had to sleep on, into a soft bed. With the wave of a hand, he could have boomeranged the spit of the accusers that were spitting on him that that crucifixion night right back in their own faces. With a nod of his head, he could have paralyzed the hand of the man who twisted that crown of thorns and smashed it onto his head. But he didn't do that. I got to thinking about that crown of thorns this week. You see, part uh, of the Word becoming flesh, the best part, I guess I would say, of the Word becoming flesh is not that he surrendered to time, not that the boundless became bound. The best part of the Word becoming flesh was his surrender to sinlessness. That's who Jesus was, the sinless one. And when I think about the crown of thorns, and I think about what thorns represents, this is a perfect picture uh, for me uh, of the cross and what it means and what it represents. Because what do thorns represent in the Bible? Have you ever stopped and asked that question? What is it that thorns represent? Well, if we look at Scripture and we kind of walk through from Genesis to the end, what we find is that thorns do not represent sin. What they represent is the consequences of sin. If you go all the way back to Genesis chapter 3, there you have Adam and Eve in the garden, and they make that foolish choice to listen to Satan rather than to listen to God. He gives them all the opportunity in the world to to do right. He gives them one opportunity to do wrong, and they jump on that. And do you remember what the consequences for that sin was? Not only was Eve now going to have enmity between her and Satan, was there going to be this, this anger, this hatred toward one another, but, but there's all this pain and childbearing, and I know you ladies are so thankful for that. And, and then we get to Adam's consequences. And do you remember what Scripture says? Because you have listened to the voice of your wife, verse 17, Genesis 3, and have eaten of the tree of which I commanded you, you shall not eat of it. Cursed is the ground because of you. In pain you shall eat of it all the days of your life. Thorns and thistles it shall bring forth to you and you shall eat the plants of the field by the sweat of your face you shall eat bread until you return to the ground for out of it you were taken for you are dust and to dust you shall return the consequences for their sin were thorns in numbers chapter 33 as the children of israel begin to swoop in and take the land of promise we know as we've been studying the judges that they don't follow God's commands. They don't do what God says. And if you look at Numbers 33, verses 50 through 55, what God says to us is, because you have not obeyed my voice, these people that you have left are going to be thorns in your side. The consequences of our disobedience is thorns. Matthew chapter 7, as Jesus begins to wind it up, the Sermon on the Mount, the most powerful sermon ever preached in the history of sermons, He reminds us that the fruit of sin is thorns. 
And so if the fruit or consequences of our sin is thorns, then isn't the crown of thorns that that Jesus had thrust on his head a perfect picture? It's a perfect picture of what he's done for us. He's taken the consequences for our sins and he wore those to the cross. The same sin that pierced his heart, he wore on his head. And I'm wondering, as we sit here today, and I know... In a congregation of this size, there's somebody here struggling with something. I'm wondering what thorns, what consequences are you facing in your life right now? What are the consequences of sin that you're dealing with as you sit here in this auditorium, as you sing these songs, as you pray these prayers? What sins, what consequences are you dealing with? I know some of you are dealing with shame, the thorn of sin, the consequence of sin. You deal with that on a regular basis, this thing called shame. And it just kind of weighs you down. It just sits there, and you can't seem to throw it away. You can't seem to get rid of it. It just just weighs heavy on you. Maybe yours isn't shame. Maybe yours is fear. Maybe your consequences is fear because nobody has really found out yet about those bad choices that you made. And so you're kind of just living in this, in this state of, oh, I hope nobody ever finds out, but man, what if they do? And, and you're just kind of torn up over it. Maybe yours is not shame or fear, but maybe yours is disgrace. You know, some people refuse to even walk in the church because the consequences of their sin has led them to be, in their own minds, disgraced. Maybe yours is discouragement or anxiety, but here's the point, here's what I want you to get today. If you take nothing else from the lesson, take this. Jesus carried all of those thorns, the ones that you're bearing right here, right now, the ones that I bear in my own life. He carried all of those thorns to the cross. He has already borne the consequences for your sin and for mine. And if that's not a reason to say amen, I don't know what is. But he has borne that for us. He's carried to the cross already our sins and our failures and our shortcomings. Let me remind you of Matthew 27, verse 26. Then he released for them Barabbas, and having scourged Jesus, delivered him to be crucified. The soldiers of the governor took Jesus into the praetorium, or the governor's headquarters, and they gathered the whole battalion before him. And they stripped him and they put a scarlet robe on him and twisting together the consequences of our sins, the crown of thorns, they put it on on his head and put a reed in his right hand. And kneeling before him, they mocked him saying, Hail, King of the Jews. And they spit on him and and they took the reed and they struck him on the head that still bore my sin and yours, that crown of thorns. And when they had mocked him, they stripped him of the robe and put his own clothes on him and led him away to be crucified. As they went out, they found a man of Cyrene, Simon by name. They compelled this man to carry the cross because Jesus was unable through the beating that he had just taken. And when they came to a place called Golgotha, which is the place of a skull, they offered him wine to drink mixed with gall, but when he tasted it, he would not drink. And when they had crucified him, they divided divided his garments among them by casting lots. And they sat down and they kept watch over him there. And over his head they put the charge against him, which read, This is Jesus, the King of the Jews. And then two robbers... (laughs) were crucified with him, one on the right and one on the left. And those who passed by derided him, wagging their heads and saying, Hey, you who destroy the temple and rebuild it in three days, save yourself. If you're the Son of God, come down from the cross. So also the chief priests with the scribes and elders mocked him, saying, (laughs) He saved others, but he can't save himself. He is the King of Israel. Let him come down now from the cross and we'll believe him. He trusts in God. Let God deliver him. If he desires him. For he said, I am the son of God. And the robbers who were crucified with him also reviled him in the same way. 
And from the sixth hour until the ninth hour, there was darkness over all the land. And about the ninth hour, Jesus cried out with a loud voice, saying, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, that is my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And some of the bystanders hearing it said, this man is calling Elijah. And one of them at once ran, took a sponge, filled it with sour wine, and put it on a reed and gave it to him to drink. But the other said, leave him alone! Let's see if Elijah comes to save him. Jesus cried out again with a loud voice and yielded up his spirit. Jesus went through all of that to take care of the consequences of my sin and yours. He went through all of that for you. And when he cries, Father, forgive them. It was my thorns. It was the consequences for my sin. It was your thorns and the consequences of your sin that were thrown and thrust on his head. And what I pray today is that this gives you another picture of the cross. I hope that it helps you to see exactly what Jesus did for us. Because if that's not enough, he does so many more things than just that. He doesn't just wear my sin and take away the consequences of my sin. He defeats death. He conquers it. He he deals death a death blow. He absolutely overcomes it by walking out of the grave three days later. Resurrection resurrection. This is the defining difference that sets Christianity apart from all other religions that are out there. It's been said that if there were no resurrection, our world today would never have heard of Jesus, and I think that's probably true. The resurrection is the defining moment of all moments in the history of the world, and in Luke 24, when they return to the tomb, the angel reminds them, why do you seek the living among the dead? He's not here. He has risen. Jesus was not resuscitated. He was not reincarnated. He was not recreated. He was resurrected. Most religions today have holy places, not Christianity. It doesn't have a holy place. Other religions have tombs. Christianity does not. Jesus died, and Jesus was literally resurrected. That means something. It means he is still alive today. The Christian hope is not life after death. (laughs) Oh, hear this today. The Christian hope is not life after death. It is life, period. Because that's what Jesus offers us. That's what he gives us. In John 11, Jesus reminds us that I am the resurrection and the life. And in John 14, he says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And no one comes to the Father except through me. Resurrection faith is built on resurrection fact. And that's what we have today. We have resurrection fact. Think back to the Gospels. Think back to the history that surrounds the empty tomb. Do you recognize that no one, no one ever has said, no, the body's still there. (laughs) Even those who were enemies of the cross cannot deny that the tomb was empty. To me, it's so amazingly clear, no one denies the grave was empty. And today, we're not here to debate whether or not the tomb is empty. We're here to declare that it's empty, and it will always be empty, because Jesus Christ rose out of that grave. He conquered death. That is exactly what, what, what Peter said that he did in Acts chapter 2. Do you remember this? Oh, I love this. Pentecost, first sermon, resurrection. There it is, Acts 2, verse 22. He says, men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, the man who attested to you by, by mighty works and wonders and signs, which God did through him in your midst, as you yourselves also know. This Jesus. This same Jesus. This Jesus, delivered up according to the definite plan and foreknowledge of God, you crucified and killed by the hands of lawless men. But God raised him up. Isn't that why we're here today? God raised him up. 
losing the pains of death because it was not possible for him to be held by it. For David says concerning him, I saw the Lord always before my face, for he is at my right hand that I shall not be shaken. Therefore my heart was glad and my tongue rejoiced and my heart shall also uh, rejoice. My flesh will also dwell in hope. For you will not abandon my soul to Hades or let your Holy One see corruption. You have made known to me the paths of life and you will make me full of gladness with your presence. Listen now, brothers, he says, this is, this is Peter. I, I, I say to you with confidence about David. He's dead, he's buried, he's gone. Being therefore a prophet and knowing that God had sworn with an oath to him that he would set one of his descendants on the throne, he foresaw and spoke about the resurrection of the Christ, that he was not abandoned to Hades, nor did his flesh see corruption. This Jesus God raised up. This Jesus God raised up, and of that we are all witnesses, being therefore exalted to the right hand of God and having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, he has poured out this which you yourselves are now seeing and hearing. For David did not ascend into the heavens, but he himself says, the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. Let all the house of Beltline know, I mean the house of Israel, let all the house of Israel know Therefore, for certain that God has made him oh, both Lord and Christ. This Jesus whom you have crucified. Over and over and over again, Peter declares resurrection to them. He's not debating it. It's a done deal. It's settled in his mind. Is it settled in yours? Resurrection faith is bound or is built upon resurrection fact. We're not called to debate. We're called to declare. We must do the same thing that Peter did. Day in and day out, every single moment, the breath of life is in our bodies. We declare Jesus is raised from the dead. The tomb is empty. And we don't just do that by what we say. We do that by how we live our lives. Every single moment of every single day, moving and acting and breathing as if Jesus were right here with us, showing the world something else to look at than the same old, same old, the same status quo that's out there. This is what the resurrection means to us. Salvation, yes, discipleship, yes, but more than that, it means that I can live my life free because he's the only one I answer to. I don't answer to you. Did you know that? You don't answer to me. We all stand before God. And the question is, what are you going to do with Jesus? What are you going to do with him? You cannot stand at the foot of the cross and not be changed by him. Some of you are trying, <laughs> but you're either for him or you're not. And my prayer today is that you will be for him, that you will declare with Peter this fact that Jesus is raised from the dead. You will live every single moment of every single day pointing people to the empty tomb that will never again have a body in it because that's not how Jesus rolls. He walks out of empty tombs. He, 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 he stands up and he says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And if you want that life, it's simple. Just come to me. Just come to me. And today I invite you to do that. I invite you to come to Jesus, the author, the source of life. Today, I invite you to give your life to him if you haven't done that yet. Today, I, I invite you to throw away, to get rid of the consequences that you're holding because Jesus has already taken care of that. Why are you holding on to what Jesus has already removed, what he's already gone to the cross to take care of, and that's the consequences of our sins? Will you let it go today? Will you let us pray for you? Will you let us be there for you? I hope that the answer is yes. And so if we can help you or pray for you or do anything at all for you, we invite you to come right now at this very moment while together we sing this song for your encouragement. Faithful love flowing down from the thorn-covered ground 